Hello, this is uh, Stephen Hoover. Welcome to the Wagstaff blog. Today we're talking with Oli Sasson about the 1994 Fantastic Four film. Oli, uh, thank you for coming out today to talk to us about the film. Uh, Thanks for having me. Sure thing. What was your uh, background uh, prior to getting this uh, feature film uh, directed? Did you, you come from uh, commercials is where you started? Well, music videos, actually. Um, started doing music videos here in New Orleans in the very early days of MTV. Uh, in fact, uh, I'd say 75% of the music videos that I directed, and I did literally 100 of them, hmm. are on YouTube. Oh, they are. And my very first music video, <coughs> excuse me, but my very first music video that I did was called, uh, the song was called China, the band was called the Red Rockers. It's on YouTube right now, so go check it out. And we did that on, a, on, a, on, our, on our own, essentially. Uh, I knew the guys in the band because I played in a punk band back in the 70s called Sex Dog. Uh, in fact, we still play, dig that. Okay. Um, and we wrote all our own stuff, great band. Uh, but in any case, I, I got to be friends with the guys in the Red Rockers and they went out to San Francisco. They got signed to a, a, a label out there. They got picked up by CBS Records. Uh, all of a sudden they called and said, hey, we got to do a music video. I said, great, man, let's go do a music video. So I called CBS <laughs> Records, and they said, well, go ahead. We're not giving you any money. We don't know who you are, and good luck. If you don't have the band, uh, if you don't have a video done by the, uh, for the band in a month, we're bringing them up to New York, and we're going to get a video done. Mm. So I said, okay, fine. So I said, oh, shit. Uh, so now I got my one credit card, and I went and borrowed money from the guy at the time who owned Mushroom Records mm -hmm. near Tulane. Right. And we got the video done. And it turned out to be a hit. Oh, great. And CBS loved it and uh, immediately hired me to start doing music videos all over the country. I was in L.A. doing a, a video for a band called The Romantics. Right. Yeah, and a friend that. of mine in, in the advertising business had uh, knew some guys out there that owned a company called Filmfare. They sent a rep over to the set. The guy hung out, just watched a shoot for a little while. He said, gave me his card, call us before you leave. I went and saw him the next day. They offered me a job, they said, you want to move to L.A.? And I said, sure. So they paid for everything for me to move to L.A., put me on a retainer, and I moved to Los Angeles. And that's basically how I got started in the business out in L.A. Hmm. Was that the, uh, the Romantics had a couple of hits. That's what I liked about you, I believe. Was, yeah, it was, was, uh, was a different band. <coughs> yeah, no, that was them. <laughs> okay. Uh, the song was called One in a Million. One in a Million, okay. Yeah, but I, I did videos for really cool people. Eric Clapton, Bonnie Raitt, John oh, Lee Hooker. Mick Jagger, uh, Celine Dion, Gloria Estefan, Bruce Hornsby, Mr. Mister was a great video we did, uh, which is also on YouTube. <laughs> and at that time, I mean, Broken videos, Wings, you know the song Broken Wings? Yeah. Take these broken wings. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, I mean, videos, that was a, a, a foray for a lot of film directors into uh, the industry. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Michael Bay, David Fincher, all those guys were coming up literally behind me. Right. Um, and uh, obviously they did a whole lot better. <laughs> but <laughs> so, so we, we get to... <clears throat> but they were nice cats, and I, I, I got to be friends with all those guys back then. Right. Yeah. And um, you had the opportunity then to move on to a feature project, or did you do any short films? In the, in yeah, the I did a short film uh, called The Roommate with, uh, with Bill Paxton. Oh, ah, great. And uh, that film uh, went to Sundance. Uh, it was a black comedy. Kind of a weird film, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on YouTube? Uh, no, that's not on YouTube. But you I should, get, I should get that on YouTube. My God! Um, Paxton has some fan base. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, but I, I did that with uh, uh, another uh, local guy named David Dubose. Right. And <clears throat> David and I uh, were in LA together. We wrote screenplays and uh, wrote a script that we sold to uh, Lifetime Channel that I that I ended up directing. Right. Bill Paxton is in your short film. He has right. a band. He has a band as well, correct? Well, he had a band back then called Martini Ranch, and because the company I was working with at, at the time, uh, uh, what was it? O Pictures? No, DNA. We were doing a lot of music videos, and we were more or less one of the premier music video companies at the time. So lo and behold, in, in walks James Cameron and <laughs> Bill Paxton because they needed a, a music video production company to do the production, believe it or not, for James Cameron. <laughs> um, 
but we had the music video sort of infrastructure and the whole right. with all set up to do them and knock them out. So James Cameron walked in the office with Bill Paxton and we produced the video for them. Uh, James Cameron actually directed the video hmm. for Martini Ranch for Bill Paxton. Nice. Now, and that's that on how, YouTube. <laughs> and that's how I got to be friends with Bill Paxton. Yeah. And then okay. I talked to Bill about being in this short film that I was making, uh, and he saw my music videos, and he said, yeah, man, you, you, yeah, sure. Great. And that's how that got Where, started. Was that made in L.A., the film? Or yes. Or did you come back, you didn't shoot it there? Yeah, we, we shot it in Los Angeles. Uh, and then the film went to Sundance. Right, was, which is uh, good. It was accepted and shown at Sundance Film Fest. And, of course, it was a weird little movie. I don't know. I wouldn't exactly say it was ahead of its time, but it was a very dark, bizarre comedy. <laughs> Right, he's about a on YouTube. young we'll Miltos guy who worked in a morgue, so. ah, <laughs> and Bill Paxton was like his nemesis. Right. <laughs> but that film uh, got me a job uh, uh, with Roger Corman. Ah, how did that happen? And you see, at the time, it wasn't it, it, just shortly after that. Like the guys I was mentioning earlier, the big video directors, David Fincher, Michael Bay. I mean, look, those guys are very talented guys. There's right. no question about it. But Nobody was looking at music video directors to, to do feature films at that time. Mm. Uh, everybody, pr up to that point, if you think about all of the big directors that started with Roger Corman, that's true. That's where these guys yeah, cut their teeth and got a chance to have a feature film. Right. I From mean, you look like Ron Coppola, Howard, Ron Francis Howard. Coppola, you go down the list. Right. Uh, uh, Joe Dante and producers. James Cameron started right. there. James Cameron directed films there. Gail Ann Hurd started there. I mean, it, it's a who's who of uh, who, right. who ended up making, you know, Scorsese. They all worked so, for yeah. Roger Corman because they were desperate to get a film made. Right. So you got, you went there. So I ended up you going did it on there. a budget, and you, you get experience though, and then you can move up. Yeah, my first film uh, that I did for him was called Forced to Fight. It was a prison Somebody's film with Richard Roundtree. In the laundry room. And it believe it or not, the film got a great review and variety. I was kind of, I wasn't shocked about the review because it was a good movie, but. <laughs> right. I thought, wow, I got a review and variety of about uh, Roger Corman movie. Right. It was a, really, it did turn out really well. It was a good film. Uh, and then I did another film for Roger. So it was kind of embedded in in the Roger Corman school of filmmaking. <laughs> right. And what budget were these films at the time? Oh my because, God. But it was 35 millimeter. Of course. Oh, we're all shooting film. Then. But you know, back then, Roger Corman. He was he was very frugal and, and very <laughs> economical, say the least. Say the least yeah, guy. Right. <laughs> Barely had toilet paper in the bathrooms, man. <laughs> he would go uh, and get short ends and recans, and ah, he had old okay. old Airy BL 35 millimeter cameras, and it drove the color timers crazy at uh, Photochem because none of the emulsion numbers matched, and they, you go from one cut to the next, and the color's like, this, this shot's blue, this shot's green, it's like, ah! Yeah. But he was getting it done, he had a oh, pipeline, yeah. he had a system. He, he had, had a formula, had a, uh, and formula. he hired young filmmakers that he thought that had the ability to get the job done, and he'd never bother you. He would look at the hmm. dailies for the first two days, he could tell if you knew what you were doing just from looking at dailies, because Roger was a filmmaker. Right. He made movies, he yeah. made a lot of iconic films in the 60s, and, uh, he, he, he would look at the film and say, okay, this cat really knows what he's doing. I'm gonna let him alone. And you never saw him. And you got a chance to make your movie. You just had to make the day. Right. And he had some really good ideas on, on how to make your day. Just little mm. rules of thumb things. And I, and I still live by it. You know, when right. you go out and shoot, you just get, get your first shot up and running, you know, an hour after call. Uh, don't talk on the set you know, about stuff that's not related to the shot. And if you make a shot and you got to redo it and you're already set up, don't stand there and talk about it two or three minutes at a time. If you talk, stop and talk two or three minutes at, at a time, times 10, you've lost 30 minutes of your day. Right. And I said, wow, this really makes sense. Right. So when we have a shot set up and he said, you know, if there was a problem with it and there's any doubt about sound or focus or the actor wanted to just shoot it. Right. It's Could quicker to just, you know, because it take, how long does it take, you know? Right. We never did takes more than three or four minutes anyway. Right. You know, you do a take or whatever, you say, okay, we're already set, you got the marks, just shoot it. Hmm. And that was just good rule of thumb stuff, you know? Right. And this is all, uh, this is basically a film school for a lot of the famous directors <coughs> today. Absolutely. That school. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the Fantastic Four property, um, I guess we'll talk about kind of context. At that time, 
I mean, we'd had the Superman film would come out, which was a big budget, but then by the, as the Superman movies went on, they got lower and lower budget films. So, right. <clears throat> I mean, people today, the younger viewers here may know, okay, we got these billion dollar <laughs> Avengers movies, but back then, superheroes were sort of, you know, it's kid stuff. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, when I got hired to do the Fantastic Four, you know, everybody knows the story now about how it was just made for contractual uh, requirements for Constantine film in order to keep the, the rights to the, to the uh, Fantastic Four. Right. Uh, they had to get a film made by a certain date or they were going to lose the rights. Right. So they went to Roger Corman, knowing Roger was king of the B-movies. <laughs> he could crank stuff out quick. I think we had two months before their, their contractual, uh, whatever it was. The obligation expired. was going to expire. Yeah, the obligation was, so it was going to expire. They would have lost the rights. You'll so get it was like, I, for whatever reason, I guess because I made a couple good movies for Roger, I got the call. Right. And I was thrilled because I thought, you know, as a, I was, as a kid, I, I really did like Spider-Man and... Fantastic Four. I was more of a Marvel comic right. book guy than I was DC. I, I thought, you know, D Superman, I, I, I could never be Superman, but I could be Spider-Man. Right. That was the really the Stan Lee formula was exactly. relatable characters. Exactly. Anybody could become a superhero by an act of God or fate or whatever you right. want to call it, you know? And I thought, well, gee whiz, that's, that, those guys I could relate to as a kid. They were more like me than I, you know, Superman right. came from another planet. You know? Right. That's exactly. That's like pretty far out. Um, but... So anyway, we got the call, go do the film, and unbeknownst to any of us, we knocked the film out. But going back to what you were saying earlier about the comic book universe not being well known or appreciated in Hollywood at right. the time, I got to be really good friends with Stan Lee. Hmm. And that was a really big plus for me right. for doing Child the film. Icon. <laughs> and literally, we would go, Stan and I, Stan, I, I, I go hang out at his office there on Wilshire Boulevard at Marvel offices, and his, his office was like <laughs> being in a Marvel toy store. Wow. I mean, he had everything on the walls, <laughs> figures, posters, pinball machines. It was, I mean, really cool. And, and we started talking about trying to do something else together. Right. Because at that time, I, I, uh, I just started doing Xena uh, and Hercules in New Zealand for Sam Raimi. So I'm hanging out with Stan Lee, and everybody in Hollywood was curious to meet Stan Lee. Right. But they didn't want to do anything. Yeah. And so Stan had a comic, unpublished, finished comic book called The Femazons. <laughs> and it was a little bit like Xena, right. but it was about women rule the universe. Yeah. And he had the finished comic do. book, <laughs> and Stan and I, we had meetings at Paramount, oh, at right. Universal, and all. And everybody's curious about, oh, yeah, well, we'd love to meet yeah, Stan Lee. Yeah, we'd love to meet Stan Lee, right. But we don't, we don't understand this comic book stuff. And <laughs> nobody would, would, would give buy us, it. would yeah. buy it. Right. <clears throat> and then, of course, jump ahead and see what happened once they got the smarts to start, you know, turning comic books into these major motion pictures. Right. Well, the technology also caught up to the... Well, that's to, true. To the art. That's a big, big, good point. Because if you look at the film that we did at the time... There, nobody was doing big computer graphics back right. then. Was, I mean, yeah, and it was, and, and unfortunately, we the, we didn't have any money to do practical to things. even <laughs> get the better guys that were in the business. So uh, there was a guy that came on board, and he was a freaking disaster. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, that's another story. Yeah. Were um, some of those? I mean, it looked like some of them were almost like temp. temp they were. Effects, they were almost effects. like they were what you call an animatic. Right. They were. They were. They would have been like the storyboard effects for the bigger effects houses to really get in and there and, do and, it. and to go back and embellish them and make right. it big. But then that money was never spent, like the famous Johnny Storm, you know, kind of beating the light beam at speed or whatever. Oh god! It almost looked like it was yeah. animated. It, it, it was real. It was very. The, the, I hate to say it, the, the, the visual effects in the film are just low, low grade, amateurish. But the film for us. And me and the actors in particular, I mean, the crew, everybody, the makeup guys did a brilliant job. I think, you know, even on other blogospheres and the fan base out there, right? the real Fantastic Four fans, they love our thing. Yeah, he's very effective. He's very real. He, he wasn't all chiseled and looking like a stealth 
you know, yeah. kind of thing. And Our thing had... was like from the original comic, and that's what we did. We based, I went over to the Golden Apple, which is the big comic book store on Melrose Avenue, and I picked up every comic book that, that was in the right. Fantastic Four universe. <laughs> and they had, you know, had like the, the binded, you know, right. Uh, what do you call them? Those like the Bibles, like the books. Yeah, they compendiums had. that they have. Yeah, they have, from uh, the reprints and all the uh, reprints, reissues. And so I went and got a, a little small stack of the first comic book, the number one issued comic book from the Fantastic Four. Handed it out to the costume wardrobe, you know, uh, production right. designers in our so in our first yeah. production meeting. I said, "This is what we're going to base our movie on." Right. And that first this one. That for Stan was really a turning point because he was burnt out on comic books and he oh. wanted to write something that was real characters. Yeah. And uh, real, and it's a, it's a family conflict, uh, you know, going on between the brothers. Oh, absolutely. The whole, the whole four of them, which I think your film did a good job capturing. So I think, you know, in, in regards to the story, character development, relationships, acting, you know, we've had a lot of the fans say, that is spot on. Right. And I'm not going to compare it to any of the bigger movies because it's really, I mean, well, how can you do a, that? It's a B movie. I mean, I think I mean, there was a... There's no uh, way you can say a $2 million can right. compare with a $50 million movie. Right. But at least the, 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 the stuff that was important for me as a director, I mean, obviously visual effects were important, but I could see we weren't going to get what we envisioned. Uh, but we, at least we got good performance. We got a good story. The film has a lot of heart. And that was what we, we, we went for, and we accomplished that. So. Was, uh, was there an intent for Dr. Doom to be overdubbed later? Because, you know, with the mask, he did have some, some audio problems from time to yeah, time. Yeah, we were, we were definitely going to put him in, uh, in, a, in a dubbing stage and let him. And Joseph Culp, he's a terrific actor. Yeah, he did a good I stuff. mean, the guy is he's, he's Shakespearean. Right. I mean, he really did play Dr. Doom like he was doing Shakespeare. And he was very, very well trained in Shakespeare and everything else. Right. All good cast. Everybody in the film were just really terrific actors. And, and the tone of the film, I mean, the original comic books, it is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and there is humor. And I think the film did a good job of capturing that as well, whereas you know, yeah. the new films have just gone kind of totally serious and dark. Um, well, that's a, I'm, I, that, that's a good point, because that was one of the things that we said in the production meeting. I said, guys, and dare I use the word campy, right. but I just say, look, we're not going to be able to do this like, like Tim Burton's Batman. We right. just don't have the budget. We don't have that, that, we just can't do it. Right. So we have to go off the idea that we're making a movie like this is the 1960s. Right. And what was really popular in the 60s was the TV show Batman right. and stuff yeah, like that. that. So we kind of thought, Look, we can't do the big, dark, brooding, like, Gotham. Right. So let's do... So I said, look at the comic book. Once again, go back to the original. And just the style of it, the artwork, everything about it that was... Uh, the, the first reality of the Fantastic Four. We said, let's try to at least get something right. Don't try to reinvent the wheel on a, on a shoestring budget, because it's not going right. to work. You're not going to outspend them, but you can do your own little unique take on. Yeah, but at least let's let's be let's be true to the fans, true to the comic, and that's what we try to do more than anything. Not reinvent it, not restyle the thing, not you know. I mean, we just really tried hard to make it like what Stan Lee, what they intended. Right. And how was Stan involved? Did he show up for shoots, or he was oh yeah, yeah, he was, he was, he and was. He didn't do a cameo, or I believe you said his cameo was cut out. At one yeah, point. we had him crossing the street at, right. out in front of uh, the vault where they're taking the the big diamond in the suitcase where right. the, the the where they was it the mole? Well, not the mole. Um, oh Jesus, I forgot the character's name. <laughs> Don't put that in there. Okay. We'll cut that out. The, uh, the jeweler. The jeweler. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> So the jeweler's okay. there watching them, and that, we had Stan Lee Cross in the background, and he looks over and watches the, I don't know, it got, somehow it got cut out. I, I think maybe he didn't want it, I don't know. Yeah, um, well, now he has, of course, a line in, the, in most of the In films. every one of them, they put him in, yeah, which is really line. cool. Yeah, it's fun to watch yeah, the film. Is, they, yeah, they're Stan. <laughs> they're Stan, yeah. It's like his Hitchcockian. Right, homage. Yeah. Um, so we get to the film, um, I mean, what, 
you thought it was going to be going through a different effects house to, for the post, and then well, yeah, at the at the last minute, it just like the bottom just fell out before the the film was finished. Uh, we finished shooting it, and then it was like very odd. It was like we couldn't get Roger or anybody to help us finish the movie, <laughs> and we thought. Oh, this is strange. Well, so you had the footage, but it hadn't been edited, and no, no effects. Well, we, had, we had, had it. We had been cutting it, right? But there were some still some elements missing, mm -hmm. visual effects elements, and then the, the the that first guy we had doing the effects, who was okay, we, <laughs> remained nameless. We went and got begged another company in in Venice to come help us, right? And they just they just did it. Okay. We didn't have any money, right. and the post production supervisor for uh, Concord New Horizons. She was wonderful. She was like s smuggling our our negative into the soup with other shows that right. Roger had going on, so we could finish the film. Right. The guys that did the music, the two brothers, David uh, Worst and his brother, they were absolutely brilliant. Guys. Yeah, they did a great job. Oh my God, the soundtrack is so cool. And once again, they had a minuscule amount of money, so they took money out of their own pocket because mm. they really believed in this film and they right. wanted to have a show piece and a show reel like we all did. We thought, well, when the film gets done, we'll have something at least to show. Right. That's how for you get work. The, right, for all the actors involved, for you yeah. as a director, you, for you everyone. Get, you, you get, you get work. work from the last work you did yeah. showing you yeah. that shops. Yeah, so those guys, David and Eric, they put up their own money. We got a 48-piece orchestra <laughs> in the studio at Capitol Records wow. where Frank Sinatra recorded. Right. And the there we center. were in the same space where Frank Sinatra was doing this music for our film. And I was like, I, and I was in the, just in the booth. I, did, I just sat there and I was on cloud nine. I mean, there's a 48 piece orchestra recording the music for this film. And these guys came in there and I'm not kidding. They knocked it out in a day. Wow. So there one was day. That's yeah, how that's prepared great. they were, and the orchestra came in and bam, and yeah, just but, and, and they did a great job. Oh, the music is the music's it's James Horner esque. I mean, they did right. a really great job. And really, what most people kind of denigrate now are really the effects, and those were temp. And you thought it's possibly at some point somebody will see this, say, hey, this is yeah. worth putting more money into to get these effects. Yeah, up to we speed. were hoping to get a really good visual effects house to come in and finish it off, and but they abandoned the film and. Now, how did, now, let's get back to that. Yeah, so because... They paid to make the film to keep the rights, and then Marvel gets word that, hey, this Fantastic Four film is coming out. Well, the fan base is excited about yeah, it. Yeah, but here's the only thing I can, I can I surmise from all that. Concord, uh, uh, Constantine got the deal with Roger. Right. Okay, we're going to give Roger, the, you know, just enough money to get the film shot, and we can fulfill our contractual obligation with Marvel. And I think... I'm not certain, but it, it seems like what happened is that they forgot to put a clause in Roger's contract that he couldn't release the film. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and, and I don't think Roger even thought about it right. until me and the post-production supervisor and the music guys and my editor, Glenn right. Garland. I was on another film at another company, and when, I was at, when the producers from that film left the building, we take the reels out of our bag right. from the Fantastic Four, take the movie I was working on, put the Fantastic Four reels on, and finish the, finish the movie. Finish the film. <laughs> so nobody, Roger didn't, nobody knew. All of a sudden, Roger has a finished movie in his hands. Right. And he said, oh, well, shoot, I'm going to release the movie. I'm going to make some money, more money. <laughs> and of course, Constantine Films and Marvel, they all hit the ceiling. Right. They thought, you can't release this movie. And Roger says, stop me. And he said, well, what do you need for, for, for us to stop you? He says, pay me. <laughs> I mean, there was a trailer cut. The right. trailer's trailer. really cool. Right. Well, they, that'll be on the blog. <laughs> they screened the trailer. The trailer was in movie theaters. Right. The film was going to premiere at the Mall of the Americas. The mayor or somebody at the Mall of America, somebody said it was going to declare Fantastic Four Day. Right. right. They had a release date. That All this stuff set up. Largest mall with, in America at yeah, the time, right? Yeah, through Concord New Horizons. And it was it was there were screenings at uh, comic conventions. Yeah, the Shrine Auditorium, which was amazing, uh, like like a thousand people showed up wow. to see this, and they ran the trailer, which is a five minute clip of the film on a loop, continuously during the day, and the fans were just over right. the moon yeah, for it. Ready for it. 
oh my God. It, and we just thought, this is it. This is going to be our Hollywood break. Right. Where somebody makes a small movie for no money, it gets released, it makes three or four, maybe ten times what the investment right. is. And that's all that matters. With, out with there. the hardcore fan base, they would have been there. I mean, you had yeah. an audience to I go mean, up. Regardless well, of the, the ultimate criticism at the end right. of the day, the actors, me as a director, maybe the DP, at least the production designer, the music guys, right. we've all would have had a leg up in the business right. because you make a small film for no money, it breaks out. Oh, it's a breakout yeah. film, breakout right. hit. Regardless of what the critics say. Then everybody comes up. looking you know, for you to do their next movie. Right, and say, look what he did for no money, what can he do with a bigger budget? And that's what we were kind of rolling the dice on. Right. And then they kiboshed it. So at some point, <laughs> there, there, there was there was a, a payment that uh, was kind of killed the film. Uh, Roger was it sold the film. Yeah, so he was ready to release the film, and then uh, all of a sudden, we heard the film was not going to get released. Guys at Constantine Film, uh, Bernd Eichinger, uh, he, he died actually, he had a, I went to the house, his, he called me to go to his house up in Beverly Hills and just to, to explain to me what had happened and I thought, gee, well that's interesting, we're not going to get a movie. Mm -hmm. And I said, can we at least get a copy of it? And he says, uh, no, Oli, I don't think I can do that at the moment. <laughs> So the, really, were the negatives burned? I mean, they're obviously it's on the internet and a, Shit, and a kind man. of a, well, thank God somebody copy bootlegged it and put it out there. But anyway, they went to Roger and Roger just said, "Okay, I won't release it, but I've already spent money for releasing it. And you got to pay me." Right. So I got a call from Roger one day. I remember very well where I was. I was in my car, driving on San Vicente Boulevard, that, you know, crossing uh, La Cienega or something, and <laughs> I got the call from Roger, and he goes. And he's got an interesting way of talking. He's like, uh, Oli, hi, it's Roger. I said, <laughs> yeah, Roger, how you doing? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for finishing the movie, The Fantastic Four. I said, yeah, well, why are you thanking me? He says, well, because I just got paid a million dollars not to release the film. <laughs> and I'm waiting for the uh, next, yeah, I'm right, waiting for exactly. the, I'm waiting for the, and I'm going to give you, right. you know, give you and the, and I'm going to give you guys, you know, 2% or, here. Give you something, and it's dead silence. Dead silence. And I said, "Okay, Roger, that's it." Well, I just wanted to let you know the film's not going to get released. <laughs> that was it. It's dead. You put your heart and soul into it. That's all it. These people did all this work, and and that yeah. was the end of the call. That was the conversation. I still mm. love Roger. Though. Roger's a cool yeah. guy. He's right. not Roger, believe me. He's great. <laughs> um, he was just a smart businessman. <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, and that was it. Hmm. And that was the end of it until here we are. Yeah. So 20 really, years later, it's like became infamous and underground thing. And right. And it's sort of, I guess, the internet uh, got attention out. And we do want to mention uh, props to the guys who are doing a documentary called Doomed on this yes. very subject. So good. Be sure to look good. out for that because they, they've really done some excellent work based on the trailer. Yeah, Looking Doomed. Forward to seeing that. Yeah, they did a good good job with that. That's that's going to be Marty uh, Langston. Uh, yeah, doomed. Check it out. And they've been trying to get it into some film festivals. So, uh, but it's it's good. It's a good movie. Right. Well, I mean, there's certainly a lot of uh, comic book uh, fans out there, comic book film fans, and oh, this yeah. is a, a unique story, and uh, I guess a cautionary one for filmmakers as well. You gotta <laughs> well, you know, look, I, there's big movies with big stars. You go to the right. go to the go to look at DVDs. Mm -hmm. and some of the downloads you can get. Movies that never saw the light of day. Right, it does happen, it I happens believe. To, uh, it happens to everybody. Yeah, there was really? recently oh, no. uh, Jennifer Lawrence uh, film, I believe, they kind of dumped a DVD for whatever reason. They just decided to yeah. shuffle it to the side. Uh, so, I want to ask you about a few of the kind of iconic shots from the film that a lot of the fans like. The, uh, I believe one of the, uh, the one of the thing transformations was sort of a head spin. How did... How did, how did that come about? I think you had done a, a pretty ef effective uh, transformation uh, earlier in the film, and I believe you wanted to kind of get a different look. So yeah. You kind of the spinning, the spinning thing. Yeah, effect. we were always trying to do something a little bit more creative, I guess, <laughs> something that was a little out of the norm, but also that, like I said, went back to the '60s Batman. Right. Yeah, I know that's DC, but and also just back to. Old movies in general. I'm a you know big fan of old classic films, and 
I used to love like montages in old films where they would just do newspaper headlines spinning, right. wipes. Uh, George Lucas used a lot of that right. in Star Wars. You know, right. they'd wipe right. a frame, wipe a scene up, down, or to the side. But always trying to do something in an interesting fashion that right. that would make it just a visually much more interesting transition than right. just the standard. And I think back then morphing was kind of like the big thing, where you. But but back then, if you morphed somebody, they couldn't move. Right. Yeah. It was like a stop motion. Basically. It was like almost that. like the old uh, uh, Doctor Jekyll, yeah, Mister right. Hyde, the old werewolf films, right. werewolf films from right. the forties and the thirties, where they they stand perfectly still, <laughs> and then they apply a little makeup and shoot a little film, apply a little right. more makeup, shoot a little film, and then they dissolve it all together. But right. it just never really matched. You know? <laughs> right. It would be a little bit of jumps if you said move. But now, or, I mean, people can be yeah, running and they change, you know, exactly. to whatever, and it's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. But we, we're, we're still, we're lacking in that technology. So I was trying to do something a little bit different than the standard, well, the guy's got to be perfectly still and right. walking to the thing. So I did the head spin. <laughs> What's that from? It's a good from a human it's head like, to the thing yeah. head spinning. It kind of like threw the audience <laughs> off, you know, so it's like an right. illusion to say, well, did that work or not work? I'm not really sure, but there right. he is, you know? Right. It was kind of cool to just like mess up with the, the illusion that people would see him actually do a tr flesh to stone transformation. You know? Right. Uh, there's another iconic scene where uh, the thing is like walking. I guess it's sort of like, reminds me of the Howard the Duck scene where he's sort of walking around trying to interact with people. <laughs> Howard the Duck. <laughs> You couldn't the, use the better <laughs> analogy. That okay, was, well, maybe not that, Howard the Dog. But, that movie was such a bomb. <laughs> yeah, but there was, there's a scene where he's trying to talk to the ladies, and they're sort of uh, horrified by him. I guess it's the... Uh, oh, yeah. We're saying maybe with the Hulk would be a better example. Well, We've seen you know it what? I, the, uh, I, believe it or not... Man is monster. Well, I was thinking uh, at the time really more, more of the elephant man. Ah, okay. That's a good but better, Much better than Howard the, the Duck. I mean, I, I envisioned doing the thing in a mall and right. with a lot of people and children and babies cr screaming, kids crying yeah. and screaming and parents grabbing their children and you know more like what you would see drawn in a comic book right of course at that time they had already abandoned the film uh, that was one of those sh shots that's a pickup <laughs> shot basically how are we going to do so the one of the producers there mike elliott good guy he would uh he handed us a uh, uh an old airy 2c 35 millimeter just a step above a hand crank camera. Right. It's about the same. It sounded like a coffee grinder. <laughs> but <laughs> you put a battery in it. But it's a very reliable camera. I think Aeroflex made them during World War II or something. But we, but he gave us film stock right. and the camera. And I knew the guys obviously who made the suit. Right. And so the two oh, women on the street were just right. friends of ours. Friends here. So we had the guy. In fact, the casting guy who produced Doomed, oh, okay. he's the guy in the suit. Oh, he's in the suit. Okay. He's the guy <laughs> who produced Doomed is in the thing suit. Thing so too. we drove up to... Um, it's like Sunset Boulevard or something. Yeah, it's Hollywood Boulevard. It's Vine. actually Vine, Vine. Vine near Sunset Vine is where Sunset. it was. It was near the Capitol Records building where we recorded the right. music. And we drove up in a van. I'd, I'd gotten out with the camera, we put the girls on it, and all we could do was find a place that was brightly lit. Right. So it was like, oh look, here's an overhang on a building that's got some bright lights, and I had a light meter, and said, right. yeah, what we go. got? Yeah, I got a 2.2, okay, we'll, we can shoot here. Right. And I literally let the guy, we, he stopped the van in traffic, right. and got out the, the, the people suit. in a red light, he just jumped out in the thing suit, and like people in the head, you know. <laughs> Ran across the street and he walks up to these two, our right, friends, your friends and trying to plead with them like I'm I'm a, yeah. I'm not an animal you know right, like from, exactly. <laughs> from the elephant man right. he's trying to appeal to them like I'm underneath all this I'm I'm really a human being and and, right. and that was our little elephant man elephant moment, man moment. In a, okay on a shoestring <laughs> Jesus. that's definitely guerrilla filmmaking there yeah uh, but I mean you know it, it what else can you do you think right. about you know, okay, it was all about the message and what we were trying to convey, in the right. heart of the film. It's like, you gotta just try. You can't. Right. Get out there and get it. You know, what else are you gonna do? You know, it's like at some moment you have to show the vulnerability of the character. And that was one of the scenes in which that, had, that would help us convey that idea that this guy was vulnerable. He, even though he could crush you with one hand, right. he, he was weak. 
Right. He had a vulnerable side, you know. That was part of that was part of what Stan Lee and these guys had created about this character, you know. And that's why I kept thinking of the Elephant Man. Right. And there and there are all those scenes where that he goes out and he's hanging out in the back of the restaurant, and the bus boy or the guy comes out and he says, "Hey, man, you can't hang out here. Get out of here!" Right. And he stands up, just pleading with the guy, yeah. and scares the crap out of him right. because he's so menacing. But underneath the menacing. You know, exterior, there's this guy with a heart and a soul. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we tried the best we could to, to at least. And I think the, the real fan base, they saw that and they right. felt it. And that's why we must be sitting here talking about it 20 years later because <laughs> right. the film was a real piece of crap. And I don't think we even be here talking about it. It would have right. just been dismissed and swept under the carpet. Um, I think it's a little more than just what had happened. Right. With all of the producers and the distribution and the fact that the film got pulled, I think it's something else. Yeah, it does seem like a you film know? that should have gotten its chance. It should have gotten out there. The fans should have had an opportunity to appreciate yeah. it at that time. But, yeah. um, you know, somebody went for the quick buck instead. Well, you know, the book Hollywood <laughs> Babylon, man. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're, we're just another chapter. <laughs> right. Um, okay, let's talk about another shot. The uh, there's a final scene with the wave goodbye, and I guess really, I guess that gets into the longer having these practical effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the guys. Uh, um, those guys were pretty brilliant guys, considering they were they like for instance, go back to the thing when we talked about that vulnerable aspect of his character and the weakness, and I said, look, this guy, he can say it's clobbering time, and he's got right. the, but he's also when he's with Alicia Masters and he's, you know, having a, a female, a human being touching his face for the right. first time, he's got to relax and, you know. Be able to show that. And, with the... and show that emotion. So those guys, man, they put servo motors in a rubber head. I think there were six motors, you know, and three guys standing just outside of frame running the remote right. control servos so he could do this and then look you know, vulnerable and shy and a little scared. And it was just amazing that right. they did this. And they did it in such a short period of time and they did it so well. And that's when they did the, the arm extension, right. the leg extension, and they just, there's like they got an erector set, right. you know, <laughs> and springs, and then built all this crazy stuff. Right. So that shot you're talking about, that is literally just a, an arm that they built. Right. Like with metal and like, or I don't even know what the hell was under the cloth. They just showed right. up with it one day on the set. I said, okay. And I said, man, I got to have this guy. Here's, here's the frame. We did a little storyboard. Just got, yeah, the last frame of the film. You know, the guy, he's, right. you, know, the, you know. And the wedding Reed was Richard always. just like. Yeah. <laughs> and the wedding was always intended to be kind of the finish because it's such a great moment in the comic book. Uh, exactly. Series. You just said, we got to have that in there. Exactly. Did, and I think uh, it looked pretty good. I mean, yeah. considering and we, we, and. You know, and visually we talked about it, and Stephen Perry, Perry, who shot it, um, we talked about, you know, cold versus warm, you know, and s stuff like that throughout the film. And at the end of the movie, for instance, at the wedding scene, we got a huge light, a big 20K, blew half the lighting budget, to come out there with a big warm light. Right. So it was like the sun was shining on the Fantastic mm -hmm. Four. Yeah, and you have that kind you of know. diffused look. And, uh, yeah, we, we put a little bit of diffusion on it and made it glow, yeah. you know, like in the warmth right. of a sunny day. So it just conveyed, you know, a feeling of just happiness and Yeah, and also it contrasted and, nicely with the Von Doom's castle and the darkness and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Von Doom's castle. Oh, God. <laughs> I went to this guy and said, look, man, if, if anything, go look at the Wizard of Oz. Do something. Just go. Go right. create something in that crappy computer you have <laughs> that's going to give us something that looks... He didn't do it. Yeah. And we ended up stealing frames from God knows where to try to give it some depth and some... Eh, anyway. Right. I always hoped that Marvel, after all these years, would... Who knows? We don't, we, we've heard different stories about where the negative is. We've heard that it was just completely destroyed, thrown away. I can't believe that these yes. guys, if they're real filmmakers, although they are producers, <laughs> that they would take film negative from something and just destroy it. I think it would be in a vault somewhere. I would hope so. And we always thought, well, gee whiz, you know, they've already made enough money, they've established the new films. Right. You know, go take the old movie, 
spend a million bucks, put all the visual effects in it that we thought we wanted to do, and make it really look like something. Even though I like the, the, the campiness of the, of the original film, but at least do the, redo the visual right. effects just to and lay put it, it out there, yeah. lay it side by side, and put it out there. They would make a zillion dollars. Yeah, it could be an extra on a DVD. It could be yeah, released on its own. From I mean, fans. they would make you know they would make their money back. Right. They, even if they spent two million dollars doing visual effects. Right. You know. It's interesting thing at that time. I mean, now comic, oh. comic book culture is so dominant, but at that time it was really there were fanatics. Like like me or like, like you. I yeah, mean, there were, I mean, there were, we were at the people time, would go to the yeah. conventions, and it would be you know you'd have maybe a few hundred people. Yeah. Now comic book culture just kind of dominates, and there's you know tens of thousands Huge. of people going to these things. Huge. So I mean, that might have been what well, they didn't want to invest the money because the, at that time, I guess the effects weren't there, and uh, well, that's they didn't true. know where how, how big the audience. Would I can be. understand that they didn't want to they didn't want to uh, soil the franchise. And if I was in their shoes, I probably would have done the same thing. But I think the way it was done. Right, it was done. Well, it's a little sneaky. Yeah. I mean, not a little, it was sneaky. I mean, they just. like enjoyable film experience. I mean, it, it compares, compares favorably really to the, the, the one that came out later with the 2004. It was 10 yeah. years before they came out with another one. And it did, that one didn't really capture the, the dynamic of the characters as well. I that's what that's what we've been that's what we've heard too from our fan base that when it first first one came out, the big budgeted one, the first one, a lot of fans didn't like it. Right. And because they just didn't like the way the characters were portrayed, they didn't like the I mean yeah, the effects were great, but the characters really weren't Yeah, captured. it lacked heart and soul. And I think yeah. they've they've done a much better job now. And of course, now they have a reboot of the remake <laughs> that's coming out. Yeah, which is like the third cast now. With the, yeah, the third cast. The and whole I don't. Third I don't cast. even know if they have uh, Johnny and Sue as brother and sister, which seem to be a key dynamic in their relationship. There. Well, they uh, can't be. Right. Really. Yeah. The well, cast, they because can, you know Johnny's African American. Yeah, unless they had adopted or something. I don't and know. that's that's <clears throat> that's another whole story. But yeah. I'm all for creative casting, but just that dynamic of the brother and sister was a yeah. lot of fun in the original. Yeah, because and, a lot uh, of the fans out there don't like it. Right. I mean, I don't have any opinion on it one way or the other. It's just, you know, nobody should have any opinion on it, I guess. I don't know, but I guess the fans do. Well, you know, I, I guess uh, well, they making be, changes to it or may want to be up to yeah. date and, and keep it alive and keep it fresh, which is, which is Yeah, good. I think it's kind of cool, actually. But Right. Well, um... I'll get some hate mail from that, I'm sure. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'd ask everybody to look for the documentary Doom that's going to be coming out. Yeah, it's and really cool. And you might be able to find the uh, Fantastic Four uh, film out there somewhere. YouTube. It's on the internet. <laughs> so, to give it a it look. Was, it was bootleg, but please forgive the, the visual effects as we already discussed. But anyway, it's out there. Okay, well, thank you all for tuning in uh, to the blog today. Thank you. <laughs>